Tonight on Y News. Three people were confirmed dead and six remain trapped in a collapsed grocery store following a magnitude 6.9 earthquake in Davao del Sur yesterday. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology of Philbox says Mindanao may experience more aftershocks after Sunday's quake. Vice President Lenny Robredo defers the release of a drug report of her drug report amid deadly Davao quake. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority advises motorists to brace for much heavier traffic as the holiday season officially begins next week. And nominees for the 5th Wish Music Awards are announced. More aftershocks may be experienced in parts of Mindanao in connection with the strong earthquake experienced in Davao del Sur yesterday. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology is studying if the quake affected nearby volcanoes. Ray Pelayo tells us why. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, or FIVOX, has recorded over 400 aftershocks as of today after a magnitude 6.9 earthquake rocked Davao del Sur on Sunday, December 15. FIVOX warns more aftershocks may be felt in parts of Mindanao. FIVOX OIC and Department of Science and Technology Under Secretary Renato Silidum explains the quake originated from the Tangbulan Fault which can generate a magnitude 7.2 earthquake. The Tangbulan Fault is 69.2 kilometers long located between the Makilala Malungon Fault and Digos Fault. Under Secretary Solidum adds the aftershocks that may occur are less likely the same in strength if coming from the same fault. Dahil yung lugar na yan sa uh, southern Mindanao ay matagal nang hindi nagkakaroon ng uh, ng lindol na malakas ay ngayon nagkataon na nagsimulang magsikilos ito. Fibox is now observing if Sunday's quake affected nearby volcanoes like Mount Apo and Mount Matutu. It can be recalled in 1991, Mount Pinatubo, located on the tri-point boundary of Zambales, Tarlac, and Pampanga, erupted after a strong earthquake in 1990. Parang bote ng soft drinks. Kung may bote ka ng soft drinks, walang laman yung soft drinks, kahit anong alog mo, walang lalabas, syempre. Pero kung may laman yung soft drinks at inalog mo, pwedeng lumabas. So, ang condition is the volcano will respond if there is a magma ready to be erupted. PIVOX advises the public to inspect structures before using or occupying them again. USEC Solidum stresses it is also important to learn from earthquakes in other parts of the Philippines and apply lessons acquired in preparations for that which may happen in Metro Manila and its neighboring provinces. The West Valley Fault System has a length of 100 km stretching from Bulacan to Laguna. It is feared to generate magnitude 7.2 earthquake. Solidum also wants to remind the public about the proper safety measures when an earthquake is taking place. Nakita nyo naman yung ilang mga video shared sa social media, hindi ayos yung pagkare-respond din ng mga tao na nagsisitakbuhan, na hindi naman nagko-collapse yung building. Kailangan maprotektahan ang ating sarili at uh, baka magkastampid pa kung talagang lahat ay tatakbo lang. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. At least three people were confirmed dead when a grocery store collapsed following the magnitude 6.9 earthquake in Davao del Sur yesterday. Rescuers are still hoping to find survivors under the collapsed structure. From Digos, Davao del Norte, Marisol Montaño will tell us why live. Marisol, go ahead. Good evening, Diego. Rescuers are still working around the clock to find at least six persons who are still missing and believed to be under the rubble of a green, uh, South Green Market building that uh, collapsed due to the magnitude 6.9 um, earthquake that hit Davao del Sur yesterday. Three people have uh, so far been confirmed dead by authorities. 
Authorities have identified the fatalities as Evangeline Archaga, 77, Elsa Ababon, 57 years old, and another still unidentified. According to the Fructuso Archaga, a husband who lost his wife to the earthquake were just going to buy some supplies from the store when the earthquake struck. The body of his wife, Evangeline, was recovered from the rubble at past 9 this morning. Pero ngayon, wala na. Patay na. Kita na yun. Kitang kita na. Elsie Bubar, meanwhile, continues to search for her sister, Emily, who worked as a sales lady in the commercial building. Nakita daw niyo yung kapatid ko na doon sa kitchen. Nagluluto ng ano, chupaw. Hanggang ngayon, hindi nakalabas. According to the Bureau of Fire Protection Special Rescue Unit, Emily was able to text one of her colleagues to ask for help at 4.16 a.m. She said there were six of them who were still under the collapsed building. Pray uh, that uh, we can still retrieve this and on her message sa text niya, hindi lang sa isa doon, anim daw sila po sa loob. Authorities are using life detector equipment as the search and rescue operations continues. Six others who were injured and earlier rescued are now in stable condition. Authorities are having a hard time conducting search and retrieval operations at the site because of the rain on Sunday night and the aftershocks that come one after the other. More than 400 aftershocks were already recorded by the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology or FIVOLCS as of this afternoon. The Chandler was felt on the Davao region as well as General Santa City, Sarangani, and Cotabato, among others. Classes on Monday were cancelled on all levels in public and private schools in Davao City, General Santa City, and Davao del Sur. Diego, since this morning, we still experienced several aftershocks. And that is the latest here in Davao del Sur. Back to you, Diego. Thank you, Marisol Montaño, live from Digos, Davao del Norte. Malacanang ensures the public has nothing to worry about President Rodrigo Duterte after the strong quake in several parts of Mindanao yesterday. Rosalie Cos tells us why. When the quake hit the vow, the president was having his hair cut. Papagupit. That's what the first lady said. In his house, together with the daughter Kitty, and Harriet Amansenia, the first lady, was on her way home. The car she was riding was swaying, but they were unhurt. This is the assurance of Malacanang after an intensity 5 earthquake was felt in Davao City in a magnitude 6.9 struck Davao del Sur Sunday afternoon. The palace ensures the chief executive and his family are doing fine after the quake. According to the palace official, the executive branch through the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council or NDRRMC is closely monitoring the situation in Davao del Sur. All concerned government agencies have also been mobilized to respond and provide immediate assistance to affected residents. The palace requests the public to remain calm but stay vigilant in anticipation of more aftershocks, as warned by Feebox. The government also calls on the public to refrain from spreading disinformation that may cause undue alarm and panic. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacania. Vice President Lenny Robredo decided to postpone revealing her report on the government's anti-illegal drug campaign. But Malacanian questions this move. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. Vice President Lenny Robredo was supposed to reveal to the public her findings and recommendations on the government's anti-illegal drug campaign today. But a day before the much-anticipated revelation, a 6.9 magnitude earthquake hit Davao del Sur. The vice president said, helping those affected by the quake is more important than revealing her report. Hence, the move to postpone the revelation. So yung sa akin lang parang napaka... Napakamali sa timing na asikasuhin natin yung, yung report sa ICAD. Na meron, namang, meron pa namang panahon para pag-usapan ito. Tingin namin mas mabuti na ang pagtuunan ng pansin ngayon ng lahat 
kung paano tayo makakatulong dun sa um, mga victims, sa kasamang kababayan natin. VP Robredo said she has talked with Davo del Sur Congresswoman Mercedes Cagas and listed the most important things the quake victims need. She also calls on the public, especially those capable to help, to join in providing the needs of those affected by the quake. Ang pinakakailangan daw nila as of this time yung tents dahil sunod-sunod pa yung aftershocks at yung tao traumatized na grabe. Yung mga tents sa ka-drinking water. Uh, yung sabi niya kanina, nawala na ng kuryente, nawala na ng tubig. The office of the vice president plans to send help tomorrow. Actually, since yesterday, ready na yung team. Um, ngayon lang natin nakuha yung, yung pinaka-urgent. So by today, sana ma-purchase ma na namin as early as tomorrow, pwede na pumunta. As for when she plans to reveal her report, the vice president said it would depend on the gravity of situation in Davao. It might be before December 25 or may even be next year. Malacanang, however, questions the vice president's actions of delaying to reveal her report. According to presidential spokesperson and chief presidential legal counsel Salvador Panelo, the vice president should have revealed the supposed anomalies the moment she discovered it. What's taking her so long? As the president said, bring it on, whatever you want to come out with. Yung mahirap kasi pag uh, wala ka naman talagang ilalabas at nag-iisip ka pa kung nag-ilalabas mo, ito lang matagal. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The city government of Manila may face a show cause order from the Department of the Interior and Local Government. The DILG is also pushing a bill to sanction local officials who fail to focus on the gover government's war on drugs. Dante Amento tells us why. The Department of the Interior and Local Government or DILG wants the city government of Manila to explain its failed performance in the government's anti-illegal drugs campaign. Based on the 2018 Anti-Drug Abuse Council performance audit, the Manila city government got a 48% failure functionality rating in Metro Manila area. DILG Undersecretary Rico Judge Echeveri says Manila City's drug functionality was low from 2016 to 2018. Echeveri adds Mayor Isco is not directly liable but the institution or city itself and the former local officials like former city mayor Joseph Estrada. But again, we have to give the show post order because kahit hindi naman si Isco, remember we are filing cases not on the person but on the institution, which is the city of Manila. So, kahit hindi si Mayor Isko ang accountable, he has to answer still to the poor performance of Manila City. The DILG is also pushing a bill that seeks to sanction local officials who are not functioning on the government's illegal drugs war. Under the Anti-Drug Abuse Council or ADAC bill, a local official may be imprisoned or not allowed to run in any public office. Fine or suspension, wala yan eh. Hindi nila iniinda, pero ilagay mo as one of the provision. Perpetual disqualification to rin. Tingnan mo kung hindi matakot yung mga yun. Former PNP Chief and now Senator Ronald Bato de la Rosa is expected to push the proposal in Senate, while Presidential Son and Davao City Congressman Paulo Duterte will push for the bill in the lower chamber of the Congress. Dan Diamento, UNTV News and Rescue, City of Manila. The Philippine National Police are all set to inspect and confiscate illegal firecrackers as the holiday season nears. The police leadership warns its personnel who will use their firearms needlessly during the holiday. Lea Ilagan reports why. The Philippine National Police are now on full alert status for the holiday season and for the anniversary of the Communist Party of the Philippines. PNP Deputy Chief per Operations, Police Lieutenant General Camilo Cascolan says 67,000 policemen will be deployed in the streets. They are tasked to inspect and confiscate illegal firecrackers in marketplaces. Cascolan adds they will not seal cops' firearms muscle with tape just like in the past years. We will not do that anymore because we will give our trust to our people. Diba? Mahirap naman po na hindi natin pagkatiwalaan yung mga tao natin. Mas maganda nga eh, diba? During the previous years, walang muscle taping, pero po konti ang kwan. Gusto na wala yata ang polis na, na maril or uh, nagpaputok. 
Cascolan also warns the policemen who will be involved in indiscriminate firing this holiday season. He says they will implement a one-strike policy and file administrative case of grave misconduct against policemen who will ignore their directives. The earring caps commanders and chief of police shall face charges for neglect of duty. Even if we will, if we would be able to uh, evaluate that the uh, commander has not done his uh, interventions and initiatives for our people not to uh, shoot their firearms, they will be filed the case. Papa kakasuhan po natin sila pati yung commander nila. Well, command responsibility. Cascolan says they target to improve last year's 33 recorded firing incidents to zero incident this year. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue, Camp Krame. Heavier traffic awaits motorists next week, especially on EDSA, the busiest road in Metro Manila. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority reminds motorists as well as residents to bring much more patience as the holiday season approaches. Joanano explains why. A week before the expected influx of passengers bound for provinces, the Land Transportation Franchising and Regulatory Board or LTFRB assures there will be enough public utility buses or PUBs to ferry passengers. The LTFRB has approved the application for a special permit of around 8,000 PUBs plying in several provinces within Northern Luzon, Southern Luzon, Bicol and areas in Visayas and Mindanao regions. The special permits are valid from December 23, 2019 to January 3, 2020. LTFRB Chairman Martin Dalga reminds bus operators to make sure they have alternative drivers for more than six straight hours of drive. Whatever be the case, we always remind them uh, on the road, uh, there's, there's nothing like having to remind them always to be safe on the road, to be mindful of uh, of uh, road uh, rules and regulations, and be mindful of the safety of the passengers. And since around a thousand buses will be added on the roads, the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA advises the public to brace for a much heavier traffic next week. So, yun yung, kasi ayaw nila magbayad ng terminal fee. So, that's why what they do is they crawl EDSA, uh, nagbabarker yung conductor, uh, getting chance passengers. Eh, hindi naman namin pwede payagan yun because uh, they will delay the, the flow of traffic on EDSA. To add to the bigger volume of vehicles are the last-minute shoppers. Yung one week na yan, the week before Christmas, eh, dyan po talaga yung bulto. Yan yung peak ng traffic, ano, because sila yung talagang Christmas rush na tinatawag, lahat nag-aapura na ng mamili, yung mga hindi pa nakakapamili, and then magdadagsaan yung mga ano naman, unang-una yung galing sa ibang bansa, yung ibang galing sa probinsya na dito magpapasko, eh, they will take advantage of this opportunity na mamasyal during those days. The MMD urged the public to carpool or to take public transportation to lessen the volume of vehicles on the roads. Meanwhile, the Department of Transportation is on alert status in line with the expected influx of passengers in bus terminal, airports and seaports as the holiday season approaches. The agency has launched Oplan Biahing Ayos that officially starts today and will run until January 5, 2020. Joan Naro, UNTV News and Rescue, Kazan City. Welcome back to Y News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I am William Theo, and here are the headlines. Malacanang maintains it's up to the Ombudsman to release the public president Rodrigo Duterte's statement of assets, liabilities, and net worth. Senate leadership not keen to pursue House's proposed charter change. Malacanang condemns NPA attack in Borongan City, Eastern Samar. Oil prices to go up this week. And nominees for the 5th Wish Music Awards are announced. Good evening. To release or not to release the President's Sal N or Statement of Assets, Liabilities and Net Worth. That decision is now up to the office of the Ombudsman. Malacanang stands firm. President Rodrigo Duterte is different from other public officials who release their sal end to the public. Rosalie Cos explains why. There is no law that requires President Rodrigo Duterte to furnish a copy of his Statement of Assets, Liabilities and Net Worth or sal end to anybody or to the media. 
Malacanian says the president is leaving the decision to the ombudsman on whether or not to release the document. The palace explains the president has his own style, which is unlike that of the past administrations and government officials who made their style in readily available to the public. So it's up to Ombudsman Martires to release it? Yeah, based on that is the job of the Ombudsman to release. The office of the Ombudsman is the repository of the President Sal N, based on the regulations of the Ombudsman and the Civil Service Commission. For now, the office of the Ombudsman has not released to public President Duterte Sal N for 2018 since the guidelines for public access to government officials Sal N is still not finalized. The palace also stands firm the chief executive is not hiding anything in relation to his properties since he has filed his Sal N with the Ombudsman. The law says, file it, file it. It's the Ombudsman who will release. The Ombudsman says, you wait. I'm doing my guidelines. But we're not going to be able to do it. Rosa Licoz, UNTV, News and Rescue, Malacanã. Meanwhile, the leadership of the Senate of the Philippines remains without interest in pursuing the charter change proposed by the House of Representatives. According to Senate President Vicente Soto III, the proposed charter change is not included in the upper chamber's priority list. Nel Maribohok explains why. The Senate will not interfere with the plan of the House Committee on Constitutional Amendments to push for the Constituent Assembly or CONAS even without the Upper House. Through CONAS, the proposed amendments to the 1987 Constitution will be tackled. According to Senate President Vicente Sota III, this is not included in their priority list. It's not a priority in the Senate. It's not in any of the committees. There's no resolution filed. Uh, we are not even talking about it. Senate Minority Leader Franklin Drillon, for his part, says if the lower house insists on approving the Chacha, they should include their return address because Senate and the Filipinos will not accept it. For Senator Panfilo Lacson, the issue on the manner of voting must be resolved first before discussing the Chacha. A resolution was passed by the House Committee on Constitutional Amendments. The proposed amendments include the term extension of the congressmen and local government officials from three to five years. Some senators are also not interested in pursuing the chacha. Pakakulang na ng oras, sure that na oras sa panahon ni President Duterte, hindi na niya makikerry out yung gusto niyang mga pagbabago na gagawin kung sure that ang oras. Pero still, kung pupuyde pa, buhayin. That would, if ever sent here, also arrive dead in the water. Nel Maribuhok, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The entire PNP Region 8 remains on full alert status following attacks made by members of the New People's Army. Malacanang, meanwhile, has no details yet if the incident will affect the peace negotiations with the leftist groups. Victor Cosare reports. Malacanang condemns the attacks of the New People's Army or NPA in Libutan Village, Borongan City, Eastern Samar, last Friday. According to Presidential Spokesperson and Chief Presidential Legal Counsel, Salvador Panelo, if the NPA rebels are serious with the peace talks, they should must their offenses against the government forces. The palace has no details yet if the incident will affect the possible resumption of the formal peace negotiations between the government and the leftist groups. Siyempre ayaw natin yun. Yung mga NPS, kung gusto talaga nila mga pag-uusap, eh, dapat tigilan na nila yung ginagawa nila. So when you do that, your sincerity is in question with respect to peace talks. On Friday afternoon, communist insurgents detonated an improvised explosive device on the roadside, hitting a police patrol car passing the area. Based on the PNP's update, a policeman and two civilians were killed, with more than 10 were wounded in the incident, including three minors. Investigation on the incident is underway. Our intelligence unit, in coordination with the AFP counterparts, are still conducting uh, investigation on the incident and purposely to identify those personalities involved para mapain natin ang kaso or murder for possible finding of murder and for stated murder. 
PNP officer in charge, Lieutenant General Archie Gamboa, conferred PNP Heroism Medal to Patrolman Mark Joseph Rama, received by his wife, plus cash assistance. The four wounded cops, who are now recovering, each received PNP Wounded Personal Medal. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue. President Rodrigo Duterte has appointed Moro National Liberation Front or MNLF founding chairman Nur Miswari as special economic envoy on Islamic affairs to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation or OIC. The president announced Miswari's appointment during the first meeting on Sunday of the newly created PH government MNLF Peace Coordinating Committee where the remaining commitments under the tripartite review process of the 1996 final peace agreements. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, together with the Philippine government and the MNLF, created the TRP in January 2016 in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Duterte explained that his appointment of Nur Miswari will facilitate the speedy implementation of peace agreements between the government and the Moro fronts and eventually obtain the support from Islamic countries given that most of the leaders of the OIC are friends with Miswari. Miswari is expected to attend the annual meeting of the Parliamentary Union of the OIC member states happening in Burkina Faso in Western Africa from January 21st to 23rd, 2020. Meanwhile, the leadership of the OIC is set to visit the Philippines in February 2020. Maguindanao 2nd District Representative Esmael Toto Magunadatu seeks to strengthen the security measures during the promulgation of judgment of the Ampatuan massacre case on Thursday. Dante Amento tells us why. Congressman Ismael Toto Mangundadato is inclined to think the Ampatuan clan has a plan on the day of the promulgation of the judgment of the Ampatuan massacre on December 19 in Camp Bagong Diwa, Taguig City. Mangundadato, whose wife and relatives died in one of the worst political killing in Philippine history, says he received a report the Ampatuans intend to do something to prevent the reading of the verdict. Nag-uusap daw itong nasa loob na parang hindi daw sila papayag na mabasahan sila ng sakdal. Eh sabi ko, ginawa nila yan eh. Ano pa bang, anong gusto nilang gawin? Balikta rin ang mundo ng hustisya. With this, Mangunadato asked to strengthen authorities' security efforts, particularly in Camp Bagong Diwa. Mangunadato threatens to step down from office if the suspects get acquitted. Ito yung pinakasukatan ng, uh, ng hustisya ng Pilipinas. Itong magindaraw masakir na to. Pag walang na-convict dyan, pinasabi ko, aalis ako pagka-Congress mo. Mangudadato and other families of the victims remain positive. Justice will be served after 10 years. The lawmaker adds, evidence is sufficient and strong against the accused. Malinaw naman to eh. Wala namang kakayahang pag-utos dun sa operator ng bako na sige, maghukay ka dyan at ilibing mo yung mga buhay, yung mga pinatay. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue, City of Manila. In other news, local prices of petroleum products will slightly increase this week. Shell Philippines announced on Sunday that the price of its kerosene will go up by 6.60 pesos per liter and diesel by 40 centavos. There will be no changes in the price of gasoline. The price adjustment will be effective 6 a.m. on Tuesday, December 17. Other oil industry players are yet to announce price adjustments but have earlier announced that the price of diesel is estimated to go up by 30 centavos to 40 centavos a liter and kerosene by 50 centavos to 60 centavos per liter. The government plans to uh, give Wishers, another Wish Music Award is just around the corner. In its fifth year, the Wish 1075 Music Awards will recognize personalities who have given significant contributions to the thriving Filipino music industry. Your votes matter a lot. Here's why from Mirasol Abugadi. Sixty acts are vying in eighteen categories at the fifth 
Wish Music Awards, slated on January 19, 2020 at the Mall of Asia Arena. The eligibility period is from November 1, 2018 to October 31, 2019. Votes from wishers will comprise 30% of a nominee's total score, while the remaining 70% will come from a select panel of judges. Polling period, which started today, runs until noon of January 16, 2020. For the complete list of nominees and how to vote, just visit www.letsvote.ph. As in the previous installments, the WMA will again give a cash prize of 25,000 pesos to the major award winners and another 100,000 pesos to their chosen beneficiaries. Apart from the major awards, which exclusive Elite Circle Awards will also be given to honor acts whose wish exclusive videos have garnered at least 10 million views during the eligibility period. And this year, the 5th WMA will also pay tribute to industry heroes through two new special awards, which are named after the main man behind Wish 1075, Kuya Daniel Rezon. First is the KDR Icon of Musical Excellence Award, which aims to recognize an industry luminary who has left an indelible mark in the music scene through his or her exemplary contributions. Another is the KDR Icon of Music and Philanthropy Award. This shines the spotlight on a person or group that uses music to positively impact the lives of others. Expect world-class performances at the 5th WMA from big names in the music industry like KZ Tandingan, Morissette, Moira, Julie and San Jose, Ben and Ben, Four of Spades, and a lot more. Fast-rising American pop and R&B star AJ Mitchell will also give a special performance. Mirasol Abogadil, UNTV, News and Rescue. Welcome back to Y News. Some 15,000 more passengers may be served by the Philippine National Railways beginning today. Such is good news to commuters who want to avoid traffic congestion on Metro Manila roads. Asher Kadapa Jr. will tell us why. The train service provided by the Philippine National Railways or PNR has been an important alternate transport system to commuters in Metro Manila. Like 79 years old Leti Adormeo, who continues to patronize the train, which for her is more affordable and more convenient. Kung sa bus or sa jeep, maraming transfer. Kung sa jeep, it takes two, three hours bago ka makarating sa pupuntahan mo. I'm going to Bicotan, siguro mga one hour or 45 minutes. Since President Rodrigo Duterte assumed office, the number of PNR's routes within Metro Manila more than doubled from 17 to 36. This, according to the Department of Transportation, calls for transformation in the train system. As June Magno puts it, Sir, if we are to put up more stations, we have to put up and bring in more trains. Not just more trains, we have to improve also the quality of trains we are bringing in. A step forward to this vision was brought to reality today as two brand new train sets began operating. Each train is comprised of three diesel multiple unit or DMU rail cars purchased by the Philippine government from Indonesia. Fully air conditioned, well lit, equipped with security features like CCTV, safety signage and more. Every train set has a capacity of 750 passengers and can go on about 10 round trips across the routes between Malabon and Taguig City. These trains are in addition to the existing eight running trains of PNR. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, City of Manila. Meanwhile, with 21 affirmative, 0 negative, and 1 abstention votes, Senate approved today the Salary Standardization Law 5 or SSL 5 for civilian government personnel. This after President Rodrigo Duterte certified Senate Bill No. 1219 as an urgent bill. Under the proposed SSL 5, the salary hike adjustment will be implemented in four tranches starting January 2020 with every year increase until 2023. 
Around 1.4 million government employees will benefit from the SSL-5, including public school teachers and nurses. In another news, the government plans to begin relocating informal settlers along the Pasig River next month. Relocation areas have been prepared. Necessary assistance will be given. These measures are part of the Pasig River rehabilitation efforts. Aiko Miguel tells us why. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DNR, and other agencies have prepared a plan for the second phase of the Pasig River rehabilitation. The plan is to prioritize the relocation of thousands of informal settlers along the Pasig River, including those in Baseco area, Parola area, and Isla Puting Bato in Tondo, Manila City. The on-site relocation is targeted to begin on January 26 next year. This is really very necessary to restore the pier because they have taken over, over already the pier at the Parola side and in Parola uh, we will still uh, uh, for tagging it pero ang estimate ito siguro mga about a thousand also so if you will total this one uh, According to the DENR, the measure is not to merely get rid of the affected informal settlers. This is part of the Supreme Court's decision that demolition can be conducted immediately. This will be an on-site uh, relocation wherein uh, meron ng uh, naka-allocate na property para doon sa mga informal settlers and at the same time meron ding funding. Phase 2 rehabilitation is also in preparation for the routes of the Pasig River ferry boats, eyed as a permanent mode of transportation in Metro Manila. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Four persons have died and six got injured after a vehicular accident occurred in MC MacArthur Highway, rather in Bokawe, Bulacan, this afternoon. The driver of the sports utility vehicle, who is now facing charges, will be subject to a drug test, the police said. Asher Kadapan Jr. tells us why. The death toll in this afternoon's vehicular collision in Bulacan reaches four, while six others got injured. This after a Mitsubishi pickup rammed through a tricycle and five motorcycles along MacArthur Highway in Barangay Bina, Bukawe, Bulacan. The fatalities were identified as John Beso, 34, a rice mill secretary in Barangay Sulukan, Bukawe, and couple Ricardo and Irene Sumagang of Barangay Ibayo, Marilao, who were riding a motorcycle. Those injured were rushed to St. Paul and Yanga Hospitals in Bukawe. The sports utility vehicle driver was identified as Fernando Rojas, 68 years old, a resident of Barangay Panginay, Balagtas, Bulacan, and is now in police custody. Rojas said the vehicle he was riding suddenly malfunctioned and he lost control. I just wanted to go to the hospital and then I had a pain. I didn't really want to go to the hospital. I really wanted to go to the hospital. I was really angry. I was really angry. I was really angry. I was really angry. Patay na ako nun, sigurado. Kasi kinaragkad niya ako. Maya maya dumarating yung pick up. Kinain yung linya namin. Ayun, sinal po kami. Ayun, tumilang po. The PNP continued their investigation and plan to subject the suspect to a drug test. Inistart ko. Pagkatapos, nung magkakambyo ako, tapak ko yung, yung preno. Da kasi yun ang pinaka-clutch nun eh. Matik eh. Nung ano eh, biglang nag-wild. Ang unang isip ko nung nagwa-wild na yun, di, ano, umuusad na. Pero tapak ko pa rin ng preno. Yung anak ko nga, sigaw ng sigaw. Kaya yung ang kahuli-hulihan ko na ano eh, yung ban eh. The driver is now facing charges for reckless imprudence resulting in homicide. Kakalunos dahil halos nadurog, may isang nadurog ang ulo. Kaya tatlo yung dead on the spot agad. Kasama yun na isasagawa natin na i-undergo natin siya sa drug test. Kasi... Parang hindi normal yung ginawa niya. Talagang nakakapanlumo. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. And for the news abroad, here's R.L. Kamiya reporting live from Takatsuka, Japan. R.L., good evening. Good evening, William. And for the news abroad, China on Sunday called off additional 
Tariffs set to kick in on some U.S. goods as the two countries pull back from a trade war that has roiled financial markets and damaged global economies. The suspension covers additional tariffs on products including corn and U.S.-made cars and auto parts, the State Council's Customs Tariff Commission said on its website. Tariffs already in place on other U.S. goods will remain, the Council's statement said. The announcement comes two days after China and the United States agreed to a phase one trade deal after more than 18 months of escalating tensions. The two sides agreed to halt additional tariffs on almost $160 billion of Chinese consumer electronics and toys that were set to take effect December 15 and reduce economic penalties on goods that were imposed in September by half. They also unveiled the new commitments by the Chinese to buy U.S. farm goods and other products. The top United States officials responsible for talks with North Korea on Monday called on Pyongyang to make progress on negotiations concerning the nuclearization after or the nuclearization at a time of renewed tensions in the region. U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Stephen Biggin's trip to Seoul, which will conclude Wednesday, has led to expectations that he could visit the inter-Korean border to meet with regime officials, especially since Pyongyang has given a year-end deadline to Washington to reactivate talks with fresh proposals. The officials who on Monday met with his South Korean counterpart, Lee Do-hun, and was later scheduled to meet with President Moon Jae-in, insisted that Washington would not give up on negotiations and was open to discussing any thorny issues. Talks on dis disarmament have remained stalled since the, since the failed second summit in Hanoi in February where the U.S. considered the number of active nuclear sites North Korea proposed to dismantle as insufficient and refused to lift sanctions. Thousands of people joined Bangkok's biggest protest since 2014 coup after authorities in Thailand moved to ban a pro party that has rallied opposition to the government of former military ruler Prayuth Chan-o-cha. Meanwhile, riot police and anti-government demonstrators have clashed for a second night in the Lebanese capital Beirut, leaving dozens of people wounded. Kath Dumaraos details why. In Lebanon. Dozens of people were injured in clashes between protesters and the police across the capital of Lebanon early on Sunday in one of the most violent incidents since the anti-government protests erupted on October 17. The latest round of demonstrations came ahead of the talks scheduled between the Middle Eastern country's president and parliamentary leaders aiming to pick a new prime minister to lead the cabinet. The Lebanese civil defense said on Twitter that the violence which followed a relative calm that had returned to central Beirut had left 54 civilians injured overnight and treated on site, while 36 people had been rushed to several of the city's hospitals for treatments. The downtown area of the capital witnessed heightened tensions on Saturday night after a group of masked youth lobbed firecrackers and stones at the security forces who were clad in riot gear and deployed throughout Beirut. The attackers were identified by the media as supporters of the Shiite movement Hezbollah and Amal. However, neither of the groups has issued any comments responding to the allegations so far. In India, police have clashed with demonstrators in parts of the Indian capital Delhi during protests over a controversial new law on migrants. The new law entitles non-Muslim migrants from three Muslim-majority countries to citizenship if they are facing religious persecution. Protests have raged across North and East India since the law was passed. Six people have been killed in the five days of unrest. The UK, US and Canada have issued travel warnings for people visiting India's Northeast, telling their citizens to exercise caution if traveling to the region. And in Thailand. 
Several thousand people took part in Thailand's biggest protest since the 2014 coup on Saturday after authorities moved to ban a party that has rallied opposition to the government of former military ruler Prayut Chan Ocha. The demonstration in Bangkok, called just a day earlier by future forward party leader Tanatorn Juang Ruang Ruangkit, a 41-year-old billionaire, revived memories of the spasms of street protests that have roiled the Thai capital periodically during the past two decades of political turbulence. But there was no sign of any attempt to block the biggest demonstration since Prayut seized power in 2014 on promises to end such unrest. Tanatorn has emerged as the most outspoken opponent of the government headed by Prayut, 65, since an election in March that the opposition said was manipulated to favor the army. Kat Dumaraos, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the stories from around the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you, R.L. Kamiya, reporting live from Takatsuka, Japan. NHA Builder is assured of a quarter-final slot. Judiciary Magis claims fourth straight win and DENR Warriors winning streak ends. Bernardotti's details why. Head coach Pete Icaciano did a great job leading PIDC Global Traders to a heart-stopping win over DNR and ending the Warriors' winning streak yesterday at San Juan Gymnasium with a score of 74-64. Global Traders effectively guarded the opponent's big men and shooters, denying the Warriors a 7th straight win record. I don't know because the games they play, the scout got really good. I was looking for the best players that we could attack. I saw it because we were going to get up. So we clicked. We saw that we could match up with them. We had some players that we could match up with them. PITC's number 4, Rod Basalio, was hailed the best player of the game. Our motivation was that we didn't lose our winners. Tsaka yung na, nakaraang talo namin, talagang ginawa namin motivation yun dahil alam namin sa sarili namin na kaya naman namin eh kung magtutulungan kami as a team. Team manager under secretary Dave Almarines admits this victory becomes a huge moral booster for the entire team towards upcoming games. Ay, nanalo kami ng championship dahil nga hindi sila, they're a very strong team. So I think it gives, it gives everyone a, a confidence to actually uh, work harder for the next game. On the other hand, head coach and DNR director for legal affairs, Norlito Eneran, vows that his side will bounce back in the remaining two games in the second round elimination with on an automatic semi-final slot. Sabi ko lang sa mga players ko, ko na uh, uh, dapat maging lesson ito. Next time, uh, we should uh, prepare uh, better and uh, we should play together as a team. Two-time champion Judiciary Magis continues its momentum with four wins in a row after defeating Agriculture Foodmasters 81-72. LHA Builders, meanwhile, secure a quarterfinals ticket after demolishing PhilHealth Plus in a neck-and-neck -neck battle that ended with 196. Bernard Dottis, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. A group of cyclists gather regularly in Laguna to practice their hobby, cycling. But the group who called themselves the Bike Brothers added something good to their physical activity. Nina Armilio has the details. Taking up a hobby is not just enjoyable but also beneficial. Studies show that physical recreation can help with mental health challenges and isolation, improved physical health, better sleep, increased levels of energy, positive moods, higher involvement in social networks, boosted self-esteem and confidence are just some of the benefits of being involved in a physical hobby. 
a group of cyclists who call themselves Bike Brothers are maximizing the benefits of cycling. They do not just kick the pedals of their bicycles on the roads of Laguna cities and towns, but also include charity in every route. In what the group calls Charity Ride, they give away grocery items and gifts or visit a family in need, just like Agapita, who works as a laundry maid. Amid the rainy days, she needed a new roof to replace that which has seen better days, so that Agapita and her family wouldn't worry about sleeping with water dripping from the holes of their roof. The Bike Brothers bought new galvanized iron sheets, wood and insulator. They also gave grocery items to add to the family's food on their table. Maraming maraming po salamat. Una-una po sa ating Panginoon. Hindi ko po akalain na may darating ng mga magagandang biyaya na itulapag sa amin. The group of cyclists from Laguna and Alabang has also recently held a feeding project. They prepared food packs for the homeless, the elderly, and children they found in the streets of Laguna towns. Such good deed has earned positive comments from various netizens. Ago, the Bike Brothers donated a mountain bike to Tito, who sells various Filipino snacks like banana lumpia. Tito used this old bike to sell his goods, but with his new bicycle from the Bike Brothers, kicking the pedal is a lot more easier to go miles and miles earning a living. Hobby plus charitable deeds, a good mix of channeling what's good, a combo twice the benefit for the hobbyist. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. And those are the reasons behind the news this December 16, 2019. On behalf of Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo because we need to know we will always ask why. Good evening.